right, guys. You know what we're here for. We're here to talk about the still life. Um, we're all already begun on our uh, naturalistic still life in class. And for your second still life, you're getting to choose uh, your own approach, even while we'll be painting the same general setup, the same objects. Uh, I think sometimes still life can seem very straightforward. You know, it's a painting of objects. What could be compl complicated about that? Uh, but actually, the way that we handle the objects can really uh, differ greatly depending on the color and the lighting and the objects chosen and the, um, the composition that we select. That still lives at times can seem like a, a bit of human history, kind of showing us what objects were in the household or belonged to a certain person. Uh, sometimes they actually seem more like the history of the object themselves or the story of the object. For instance, when I look at this first still life, I often think of it as this, uh, the companionship of these objects. It somehow seems more about these two pair of boots residing together in this you know, semi-lit semi uh, closet area, as opposed to reminding me to think of the humans that actually wear them. On the other hand, if I look at a different painting of the boots, say this one by Van Gogh, in this case, there's this kind of divine glow around the object, and it almost seems to uh, remind us of the wearer of the shoes, but also their nobility. There's a sense that the person who works in these boots and does hard, grueling work all day, that there's some almost like a halo surrounding them or, or this kind of divine light, light shrouding them. Um, so even, you know, in this, this comparison of similar objects, you can see how the handling and the composition and the color can make such a very different sense of content. And two words I want to bring up into the conversation would be subject versus content. Uh, so the subject is the, the form that we're focused on, right? So each of these three paintings has the same subject, basically. Um, in all three, there are flowers. Um, but the content is really pretty different in each of them. So in the far left, we've got this presentation of flowers that seem to be almost like fireworks exploding in this night sky. So you're really overwhelmed with the magnificence um, and the opulence and the luxurious quality of these flowers as if they're sort of on parade. The center painting by Manet, on the other hand, uh, has a really different sensibility. Instead of this sort of explosion in front of us, it's a very kind of sweet, uh, calming, um, sort of just gently authentic. It feels like a moment from maybe any of our daily lives. And then on the right, we've got an image by Odilon Redon, uh, where these images or these, these flowers are specific enough. I mean, we might be able to name different types of flowers in these bouquets, but that doesn't seem really the point in this one. It doesn't seem about the specificity of the flower, or the type, um, but it seems like these flowers are almost a touchstone into a different world. The way that everything's a little bit hazy around the edges, the kind of amorphous background, the vibrancy of the color, um, it seems like he's leading us into some other kind of fantastic or dreamlike uh, world. So similar subject across the three, but very different content. And so as we start thinking about our second still life, I want you to, to brainstorm that as well, that we're not just looking for a different style or different kind of surface, uh, like sort of superficial differences, but we're also really trying to activate a different content, different associations, different meanings. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few different movements from the past to give us some examples of different approaches to painting. And when we look at these different artworks from the past, we're not trying to join them. We're not trying to be artists of you know, the Renaissance or neoclassical style. Um, we can't go back in time. But we can sort of borrow some of the things that they did and bring them with us into the, our current era. Um, and, and so learn from what they did while doing something new or of our own time. So as visual artists, we're wanting to be conscious of what we communicate, not only in what subjects we paint, but in how we use the paint itself. Um, additionally, we also don't want to be a slave to only one style, especially so early in your careers. Uh, we want to be able to make choices about how to say or how to paint what we're painting. So it's a good opportunity for us to try on more than one approach to painting. So one movement I wanted to bring to mind was the neoclassical movement, uh, dominantly in France, especially related to the French Academy, which was the kind of main, uh, you could sort, sort of say, um, uh, 
mono they kind of monopolized the art world at that time, kind of defined what art was, what good art was. Um, if you were a part of the French Academy, your, your career was sort of made, and if you weren't, then you had a really difficult time being an artist at this moment. And some of the prominent, prominent artists of neoclassicism were uh, Jacques-Louis David, um, Angre, uh, Kaufman, and Vijay Le Brun, just to name a few. And so the paintings they made tend to look along, like, uh, along these lines. So we have this one by David, Oath of the Horatii. And it might seem a surprising painting in the sense that these figures are obviously dressed more like uh, Romans of the ancient world, as opposed to French men and women of the 18th century, uh, right around the time of the French Revolution. But here, these French artists are hearkening back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome to remind their own people of uh, sort of the greatness of nationhood, of their loyalty to the, the state, and to conjure up these ideas, um, really questioning what kind of government they wanted. So David is painting this painting with the awareness that he's sort of stoking the fire of revolution, which was um, on the cusp of erupting. Um, formally, notice how clear, crisp all the details are. Um, there's nothing hazy about this image, but everything's sort of well delineated, uh, symmetrically balanced, a lot of sort of um, rhythm. So there's the three arcades in the back layer, three archways, and then there's the three people group in front. So using this sort of um, mirroring effect from the furthest layer to the frontal layer. Also in this portrait, um, which has a little bit less of that kind of archaic backstory, but even here you can see Angra really is attentive to detail. So he's not going to give us uh, sort of fuzzy, emotively driven marks and color but he's really trying to give you every detail of the ribbon or the satin and the lace on her dress, um, you know, exactly her facial expression, her hair, all these details that are really rich, but really based on this idea of like, let's be reasonable, rational, let's observe, let's capture all the facts, less than giving us a sense of mystery or emotion or intuition. Um, so here's sort of in a nutshell, some of the neoclassical characteristics. Definitely naturalistic representation of forms, refined brush strokes, meaning you don't see texture, you might even have a hard time believing it was hand painted, so refined and so um, perfected. Uh, the forms are cleanly and crisply defined with linear edges, uh, generally like a clear and open composition, so they don't tend to feel packed full of things or overly stuffed or busy compositions, and tendency toward uh, a general light, so not and not tending toward harsh darkness and then harsh highlights. Uh, this artist on the right here, uh, contemporary artist William Bailey, I think is a, an artist who is truly of his own time, but also has some of what we could call neoclassical tendencies. There is a sort of uh, symmetricality overall, not, not exactly mirror image, but kind of a symmetricality to his images, a cl crispness, clarity. Another good example would be Claudio Bravo who sets out these compositions for us, very detailed, right, down to the, uh, the lines and folds in the fabric, um, down to the texture of the pine cone on the far right. And yet, overall, you have almost a sense of like an inventory of these objects um, with their kind of symmetrical balance and, you know, definitely grounded in reality and gravity and a second one by Bravo here as well. So he might be worth looking up if you like this kind of clarity and this sense of kind of factuality in your work. Romanticism is another movement that actually kind of coincided and, and overlapped a bit with neoclassicism. Some of the prominent artists here would be Delacroix, Jericho, um, both in France, and then Constable and Turner in England. And so if we look at first uh, work by Constable, you can see a great distinction um, as compared to the neoclassical that we just looked at, right? This one, instead of being based on fact, although it has a lot of detail, it's also really about this swelling of emotion and swelling of the weather. Um, it feels kind of very turbulent as there's, you know, really bright sunshine on parts of the clouds, and then also this sense of an, either an impending storm or a storm that's just barely passed. Um, so you're really caught up in like the romance of the wind and the weather and the, uh, the tumultuous nature of, of life. Similarly here, a, a painting that I'm assuming you've all seen at some point by Delacroix, where he's capturing a moment of uh, uh, not the French Revolution, but a subsequent revolt a few decades later. 
Um, and here you've got this kind of windswept moment again. Notice the harsh contrast of light and dark, um, the haziness, the use of atmospheric perspective in the background and the kind of vignette uh, lighting where it gets dark around the edges. Um, so he's really trying to not persuade you with some argument as David would have about, let's look back to ancient Rome and think about uh, liberty and, and national uh, loyalties, etc. In this case, it's really about appealing to your emotions um, and you want to get behind this, this goddess who's leading the French people forward. If we look at still life, uh, we might think of someone like Chardin, who's kind of uh, elusive to categorize, but I think some of the qualities of his paintings line up with these, that it's naturalistic, but a little bit more loose in some areas, visible brush strokes, a kind of hazy quality and, and soft edged forms at times. Um, more of a busy composition in some ways, um, maybe these aren't entirely full, but there's a lot of overlap, it's a little more cropped in and then also dramatic lighting, high value contrast. So Chardin is a beautiful example of someone capturing still life with this very nuanced uh, kind of gradation in the background, a sense of the materiality of each object so you can discern metal from uh, the, the texture of the peaches or the plums, and yet there's also this definitely kind of emotive sense about it. About it. I would put Manet in this range as well. So Manet is typically categorized more as a realist, um, also friendly with the Impressionists. But there's still something about these, these little paintings that he did later in life that has a romantic quality about it with that darkness in the background, the highlights on the front, the um, kind of the quiet maybe, but still a sense of drama in these still lifes. We move on forward into Impressionism, coming on the heels of Romanticism. Um, they tended to shy away from the historical narratives or mythical narratives. They were much more interested in capturing uh, landscape and sometimes still life, especially trying to capture the, the moment and the mood and the lighting. So they're not as interested in, in trying to excavate their emotions about a subject, but they are um, trying to capture this optical nuance so, for instance, they would say, you know, I'm not going to paint grass green just because that's what we're told it is. I want to look at each component of it, and if I see, you know, shades of blue or shades of red in the grass, I'll put them there even though, uh, you know, typically we would say grass is green, right? So they're really open to looking at each moment, each, you know, little passage of a form and, and looking at how weather and lighting and time of day and all those things affect coloring. So here's another work by Monet, where you can see the difference just between those two, where here, you know, he's not afraid to put some vivid reds, even in the shadowed side, um, because that's what he, he felt he was really seeing in front of him. So they are interested in an optical realism. Uh, here's a close-up of a Monet, and you're probably familiar at least a little bit that with the idea that the Impressionists were not interested in a highly refined texture, but that they would allow their brush strokes to um, come to the forefront to be pretty, pretty uh, uh, textured at times. Um, you can see again um, across this flower how thick the paint gets in, in moments. Um, two other works by another Impressionist, Renoir. I always think too with Impressionism, especially in these cases, that I, I see a real sense of the fleeting quality of the moment that in this brush stroke, you know, if they look behind the onions, that brush stroke going toward the upper left, um, you have this sense of almost the pace of, of time. You know that the lighting is only gonna hold for a moment. And since we're also looking at natural objects, in this case, uh, you know, vegetables and fruits, we're also aware that they're only ripe for, you know, relatively a moment, a uh, short, short passage of time. So there's also something to that in the content of Impressionist work. Again, we're trying to remember that it's not just surface or style that we're talking about. We're also trying to figure out how form can alter the content or uh, change the content of a piece. Cezanne uh, usually categorized as a post-impressionist, sort of in the middle ground between impressionism and expressionism. He just has a slightly different take, whereas uh, with Renoir, I talked about like the fleeting quality of a moment. With Cezanne, it's actually a little bit more about construction. So famously, uh, it's been said that his, uh, his apples, as you see here on the right, that if you try to take a bite out of them, you would, you would break a tooth. They're like so solidly constructed that they're almost made of, of concrete, right, or of stone. 
Um, Because each of his brushstrokes is not so much a fleeting moment, but a plane in space. He's sort of analyzing it very geometrically, you might say. So it's another kind of avenue to think about if you as the artist want, how you want to analyze the world. Is it analyzing color? Is it analyzing um, structure? Is it a sense of time? Here on the right, we've got an image by a 20th century artist named Mercedes Matter and a really interesting, fantastic artist and, and teacher as well in New York City. Um, but she often, or in a lot of ways, embodies some of these impressionistic characteristics. So loosely naturalistic, but going toward an abstracted representation of form, focus on color relationships, whether it be the season, time of day, weather, but that sense of particular lighting to a moment. Often more saturated color, reliance on optical mixing. So she, she and the impressionist, let's say, if they wanted to arrive at a green, they might actually put yellow and blue swatches of paint side by side as opposed to mixing green on the palette and then putting on the, the canvas. Um, and then, of course, the visible, often highly textured brush strokes. Another example, maybe more subtle brush strokes here, but I think that's a similar impressionistic quality and, again, another 20th century artist for you to draw connections between the past and relatively current um, painting would be this artist Fairfield Porter. And although his brushstrokes are not as broken and maybe loud or visible, uh, there's a sense of his color and his, his interpretation of color and lighting still being very related to that sense of the moment and place and kind of authenticity. He also does a lot of landscapes that you might be interested in. And uh, one of the last ones we'll put on our map here in terms of historical movements would be expressionism. So whereas impressionism is trying to be, to gain a, an express an, an impression of the world around you, so looking outward, expressionism is trying to express and excavate from your interior world. So this is definitely focused and motivated by emotion and sensation of the individual artist. And of course, Van Gogh, um, again, usually categorized as a post-impressionist, but definitely heralding the way into expressionism, would be a good example of that, where it's not that he thinks that this wall has, you know, behind these objects has red and yellow spots on it, or patches of purple and patches of blue, but he's allowing his emotions and his feeling about a space to help him interpret it. And uh, we are fortunate to have a lot of letters that Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo, and in it you see that he is such a brilliant person that he is highly emotive, but I think contrary to po popular myth about him, he also is very intelligent. So he writes about, you know, I'm choosing, you know, at times he's choosing like a harsh green against a, a vivid red because he wants it to be a little bit aggravating because he sees, you know, a certain cafe, let's say, as this sort of seedy, kind of shady place. Um, so he's really thoughtful about interpreting his own feelings into color, but also trying to provide um, kind of provoke, you might say, emotion in the viewer through his color choice. <coughs> Another expressionist artist would be Matisse. And here are two still lives, one from early in his career and another from later. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see some changes over his, his age, but he also said things, you know, that he uh, wrote quite a lot. We might read an article by him soon where he writes about, he's not trying to paint the literal objects or the, the factuality of the objects, but he's interested in his emotional interpretation of them. And he, he often says the, uh, that the artist is different than a camera, that we are humans, so we're interpreting through many different stimuli, whereas the camera has only, is only interpreting light and dark. Uh, he also says exactitude is not truth. So exactitude meaning just because you've captured every fact about an object doesn't mean you've actually captured the truth of it. So the truth of our reality is, is not only cold facts, but how we interact and relationships, etc. And along these lines as well, Pierre Bonnard is another French artist uh, worth looking at, where with him, almost like Odilon and Radon that we looked at earlier, there's a sense of emotion and, and maybe almost memory. It almost feels like he's painting something, a remembered moment. Uh, where kind of the, the light of the day, the light of the window to the right side maybe was flooding in. He's remembering it in an overly saturated way from reality, but it's true to his sort of dreamlike or reimagined uh, moment. So expressionistic characteristics might include all of these. Um, somewhat abstracted, potentially. 
uh, focused on emotional associations, often saturated in high contrast color, and again, often those highly textured brush strokes. Uh, one artist currently working that I'm reminded of is Dustin Metz. Uh, and these two still lives where you can name a few objects, but there's also a highly abstracted sensibility about it. Um, on the left, almost a sense that night has fallen or a shade is being drawn across these objects. And on the right, the sense that this, uh, I don't know, maybe milk jug is sort of strangely illuminated, right? It's almost haunting uh, in the image. So we have some, um, some possibility in this uh, project to go a little more toward abstraction, but really think about why you would be going toward abstraction, what it is you're trying to explore yourself or to provoke in the viewer. So making choices and setting your goals, these are just some of the things you guys can be thinking through as you decide um, what your approach is going to be. Um, you're gonna think about what is your end goal? Do you want it to be this hyper real or even photo realistic um, kind of approach that someone like an Audrey Flack goes for? She often crops really tightly and has very loaded compositions, like very um, thick and kind of busy compositions. So that might be a goal for you to give us extreme detail. Um, or to, again, to go toward abstraction, thinking again of what your approach will be, what it is you're gonna be exploring or evoking in the um, image. Think about lighting. So we can um, play with lighting together, or if you have an idea, we have um, clamp lamps that we can arrange. For this project, you can take reference photos because of course some of us might want very different lighting or color backgrounds. Um, so we can play with lighting, take some reference photos. If you want to, you can even go in over the weekend and start playing with that. Trying not to move objects as much as possible, but if you wanna um, try playing with the light, possibly drape some other color behind, you know, along the wall behind the objects. Um, those are some possibilities. Um, someone like Richard Diemencorn here, I think is interesting the way that he crops really closely at times on the left or um, uh, zooms out on the right. But in both cases, he's really thinking about this sort of geometric abstraction of the canvas. Um, no matter how realistic he gets with his paintings or how abstract, all of them are united by this sort of geometric um, structure underlying all the images and, and spaces that he paints. Another current artist, Justin Webb, <clears throat> also uh, gets some pretty interesting compositions and makes some pretty interesting choices of angles. So I really liked this one as an example of you have the possibility in this case of maybe zooming out from our objects. Uh, most of you have saved your larger canvas for this second painting, so you have a little more space to work with. Um, but think about if you zoom out, what is it that you're also going to put in the image? Is it mostly other wall space? Do you want to hang other things on the walls? Um, for instance, he's got this, uh, I don't know if it's a bungee cord or electrical cord going through the composition. Um, he's obviously thought about counterweighting this open door with this uh, door frame on the left. Um, things like this, this carpet that he's laid down and gotten us at this perfect angle where the line of the carpet lines up perfectly with the verticality of this edge of the door frame. So he's very, really intelligent about where and what he's placing in the image. The second one by Justin Webb, here an aerial view of two rugs with that same cord we see winding through, which is kind of great. It takes you a moment to realize like what you're looking at. Um, but because of this change and what we finally figure out is kind of like a crate, right? At first it looks like a flat uh, square, lattice square even, on a wall. And then we realize, okay, this is the aerial view of this crate. Um, so again, really playful and fun, kind of surprising angles that he might explore. Another interesting angle, and again here cropped in by current artist Erin Radke, um, paints these still lives in her homes, in her home. Um, uh, and especially since having children, you'll see her integrate sort of snacks or birthday party gifts or things like that. Um, but it's kind of this great, there isn't quite an abstract layer to this composition, even though it is also representational, you can name specific forms. Um, here again, like Justin Webb with his electrical cord, she's using this uh, like Easter egg grass, I think it is, to give us this linear movement, kind of melodic curvilinear movement through the composition. Um, which is really a uh, pretty great um, way to move us through in addition to you jumping from object to object. Wayne Tebow, 
There's one uh, other artist that I wanted to put on your map. He, uh, you know, I'm forgetting if he's alive or not, but he was working in the 20th century, um, was kind of came out along with pop artists at the time. He tends to a really thick paint, almost like icing, but he also uses color in a really vivid way. So in a sense, related to impressionists who would find things like blues and purples and reds in their shadows, right? Um, but definitely much more of a pop art application where things are kind of solidified forms, sometimes using these kind of outlines that you can see, like these warm oranges and reds outlining the figures of these or the forms of these desserts in this case. Um, so that's another good model that you might be interested in. I think lastly, uh, British artist James Bland. So whereas uh, Wayne Thiebaud that we just saw was much more kind of solidified, Bland on the other hand gives you this sense that the forms are constantly in transition, that they're again fleeting forms, maybe almost ghostly forms. Um, the color is pretty evocative, maybe a little bit emotional in, in ways, sort of elicits a, uh, a response. Um, and it definitely feels like you're very aware of the artist interpreting as opposed to the, the sort of hyper real photographic kind of reference. So our objectives here, we are to, uh, trying two different approaches to painting the same arrangement of objects. We want to maximize both the formal and the conceptual difference between the two works while broadening their skill range. And we're exploring how changes in form relate to changes in content. Our process, um, maybe from some artists that you've seen in this presentation or other artists that you're aware of, um, research them and their approaches related to still life painting. Select specific artists of the past or present who will serve as models for your process. Choose an approach significantly different in form and concept from your first still life, and consider how all these aspects of lighting, shadow, color, point of view, composition, texture, and more can be used. Uh, make your, uh, you may take reference images of the still life to assist you. And before class, we want to articulate your ideas in a written proposal to be emailed to me uh, about 24 hours before class or sometime on Monday before we meet on Tuesday so that I can respond to you, give you any kind of um, advice, warnings, etc. cetera, um, alert you to any special techniques that might be relevant. Um, and you can see more details in your syllabus of how to write a, a proposal. Um, and then we'll work on this still life for the next two class periods specifically. Um, just one note in terms of grading, and I, I hesitate to bring it up because I think we are interested in something more than a good grade. I hope we're interested in being lifelong painters, but um, since we are in the school setting and it will be a graded project, I just wanted to remind you that there is two facets. Uh, the smaller one is ambition, but I think it's uh, smaller in percentage, but just as important, which is to say, to I want you guys to challenge yourself, to try something that you're not sure you can pull off, um, try something that's going to really stretch your um, uh, stretch you from your past experiences. Um, and then the second quality, of course, is execution. So given the goals, given your ambition uh, to try something new, what were you actually able to pull off as far as execution went in? Um, so think about both of those factors. Here's an overview of our schedule. So we've already, the 6 and 8, we already worked on our naturalistic still life in life, uh, still life in class, sorry. Um, by this Monday, send me a proposal at some point. Um, this week, the 13th and 15th, we'll work on your interpreted still life, so the second still life. And we'll give you one more day on the 20th to work on either one that you feel like you need more time on. So definitely this weekend, next weekend, th this is your focus to really dive into these still lives, spending probably a minimum of three hours um, each weekend on the work. And then the 22nd, we won't have it due yet. We'll begin a new project and they'll, you'll have one more weekend to work. Um, and then the 27th, you'll have your critique on both still life works, okay? So I know for some of you, this is a faster pace. You're kind of getting about two to three class periods, a weekend uh, or so for each painting. Um, so push yourself to work smarter, not necessarily harder. I do expect you to work hard, but also work smart, like make your plan, um, follow it through strategically, push yourself to maximize your time. So if you don't have uh, you know, an extra 10 hours to work on it, really think about making those three hours really matter. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you guys are gonna do. So I'll uh, get your emails on Monday and respond to you as soon as I'm able to. Thanks.
I forgot, a few student examples if you're interested. These are not from exactly the same project, but related projects from the past. And these are actually from painting one student. So uh, one artist taking Legos, this is Splinter the Parker, and trying out a, a kind of a more realistic form on the left, more expressionistic on the right. Again, in this one, uh, the painting on the left was tiny, something like four by four, and the painting on the right, sorry, that was on the left, the painting on the right was about three by four feet. And then here, slightly different project, three paintings with the same objects, differently arranged, as well as in different lighting um, and techniques. So you can see something of a neoclassical approach here, a more romantic approach, and a more expressionistic approach. Um, again, from a painting one student. So just some, some examples of, of possibilities for you guys. All right. Thank you guys so much.